Welcome to Northwest Newsweek and thank you for joining us. I'm Alex Flood. The decision by the Ford government to oversee the province's vaccine passport system is being welcomed by the Thunder Bay District Health Unit's Medical Officer of Health. Dr. Janet DeMille says by having the province implement the passports rather than leave that responsibility to individual health units will lead to a more consistent system. Corey Nordstrom has more. Dr. Janet DeMille is relieved to see the province approve a vaccine passport, meaning neither she nor any of Ontario's 34 medical officers of health will need to craft the certificates for their respective areas. DeMille says that would have created unnecessary confusion. If health units have to implement certain things, you're basically doing something 34 times, and then it, it does create uh, some inconsistencies across. DeMille expects the health unit's vaccine clinics will be busier going forward given the added incentive to get immunized. Evidence shows when you, you know, have a vaccine certification process that and where people have to show are not able to, to attend certain events that are not generally non-essential, um, that it does help uh, get people immunized as well as, you know, it improves the safety at those particular events. Or According to the province, 80% of the district of Thunder Bay is now fully vaccinated against COVID-19 though its numbers are higher than that of the district health unit. Pop-up clinics like the one here at Inner City Shopping Centre are critical to increasing that number, offering vaccination at a convenient location. Our experience is that we can get people that may not be the ones that would go to the, the Coliseum Clinic or to a pharmacy or to their primary care, that they're, we're there and they take advantage of that. The health unit recently waived fines for hair salons that opened in spite of provincial pandemic orders in June, but DeMille still stands by the initial shutdown orders and discipline for the defying businesses. It's our job to be part of the enforcement of that. So um, if we're not doing that, we're essentially allowing somebody to break the law. In this instance, we did end up waiving those um, because they did come into compliance. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Meanwhile, the medical officer of health for the Northwestern Health Unit is calling the vaccine passports good news. Dr. Kate Young-Hoon believes the passports will encourage people to roll up their sleeves and will also help reduce the likelihood of large groups of unvaccinated people gathering in a high-risk setting. She believes the decision by the province to limit the proof of requirement to certain non-essential businesses was a fair decision. They chose our settings where individuals can um, that are considered higher risk. So individuals are coming within two meters of each other or they're exerting themselves in a way that could increase or make it easier to spread COVID-19. So they've not applied it to medical services or other essential services. These are, these are things that are optional for individuals. So it's not um, required for any specific individual to use any of these type of services. The NWHU reported one new case Thursday in the Kenora area, bringing the region's active total up to five. And vaccination coverage across the NWHU has plateaued. About 73% of eligible people have gotten two doses. Young Hoon wants to get that number into the 80s. And a 53-year-old Atacokan man has been arrested and charged for allegedly administering a noxious substance to a woman, confining her against her will and assaulting her back in July. Atacokan OPP was only contacted on August 28th and arrested the accused later that day. Brian Bates has been charged with forcible confinement, assault with a weapon, and other charges. And on Wednesday, it also came to light that Bates was in possession of an arsenal of firearms. According to a tweet posted by OPP Commissioner Thomas Kareek, 70 guns were seized from multiple properties owned by the accused, along with drum magazines, 91 kilograms of ammunition, and body armor. Many of the firearms and devices are prohibited under Canadian law. And it's a project that has been in development for years, but there's now proof that a gold mine will be coming to Greenstone. Several elements of what will become an open pit mine are coming online, and our cameras were given access. Adam Riley has the details. I'm so proud to be able to see our citizens 
benefits, reap the benefits of what we're seeing move ahead with uh, with this Greenstone Gold Mine. Greenstone Mayor Renal Bourdieu is in high spirits as he sees a decade-long project begin to take shape in his community, Greenstone Mine, as it is now called, following the acquisition of its previous owners by Equinox Gold and the Orion Mine Finance Group. Several aspects of the project have expanded in recent months, including the exploration office, which now includes the construction offices, further drilling operations and a temporary water treatment plant. General Manager Eric Lamontagne says the plant will process water located in the previous mine's tailings ponds before expelling it into Conagamasis Lake, cleaner than it was. With the technology now and all the things we have, we, we're able to, to put at the entrance uh, a water with high content of arsenic and release the water without close to nothing in the Wasini. Closer to Geraldton, an electrical substation with a dedicated line has been installed by the company. An entire section of land has been cleared for the new highway to be built and a worker village complete with natural gas service has been set up which will accommodate the hundreds of people who will be building the mine. It has taken a lot to come to this point with agreements with Area First Nations and the municipality which La Montagne says that support is what made this project happen. And the municipality since the beginning are behind this project and, and help us to, to develop and, and all the community, Aboriginal community around help us too. And without all of this community, Aboriginal and municipality of Greens wasn't not able to be where we are today. Bolio knows whatever happens going forward will benefit all the communities within the Greenstone area. You know, we don't have what it takes probably to service all in one area, but we sure have a lot to service in all of Greenstone. We have a lot more to offer when it comes to pro housing, when it comes to property, when it comes to services that could be offered. Officially, the mine and its construction has not been announced, but La Montagne is hopeful that an announcement will be coming in Q3 of 2021. Adam Riley, TBT News. As part of our ongoing federal election coverage, we'll give voters a closer look at the candidates vying for the Thunder Bay Superior North seat. First up is the Liberal incumbent Patty Haidu, who is out to prove she's still the best person to represent the region in the House of Commons. Kurt Black reports. Since being elected in 2015, Liberal incumbent Patty Haidu's driving goal has been to ensure everyone she represents has a fair chance to succeed. And if re-elected for a third term, she plans to continue the progress achieved in her time in office, ensuring Northern Ontario remains a priority in the House of Commons. I know how to work uh, the system, I know how to get money from uh, various departments for Northern Ontario, and I know that Northern Ontario has so much to contribute, and we cannot let uh, the progress that we've gained in over the last six years slide by. We need to continue on this path. Making sure that Northern Ontario is on the map is exactly what I'm going to do. I do believe she remains the best candidate to represent voters in the Thunder Bay Superior North District due to her vast knowledge and experience gained in the region over the past six years. Since being elected in 2015, had the ability to learn in great detail about the strengths and opportunities that lie here in Northern Ontario and the challenges that we face as a community, as a region. And I think that makes me an excellent candidate to be the Member of Parliament going forward. Kurt Black, TBT News. Looking to unseat Haidu are four contenders, including Conservative Joshua Taylor, who's running in his first campaign. He's on a mission to bring back a sense of community he feels has been lost under the current Liberal government. Danielle Bain has this candidate profile. When it comes to conservative candidate Joshua Taylor, he believes someone needed to step up to help this riding reach its full potential. The Geraldton native wants to take an approach where everyone's voice is heard without hostility or judgment, no matter what party you belong to. I think that we need to be able to have crucial dialogues and actually discuss with one another without trying to dehumanize another person, really trying to understand another person's point of view and I think that's something that's really lacking in politics right now that I know we can't have. 
With a wide-ranging career background, which includes aerial fire detection, 911 dispatcher, and anti-vaping and tobacco programmer with the Thunder Bay District Health Unit, Taylor believes he's ready to take on this kind of responsibility and the many issues he wants to tackle. As the youngest candidate at 28, I think I understand affordability more than really any other candidate because it's directly affecting me. For example, I'm still renting, right? And I would obviously like to own a home one day. And so when I'm looking for solutions, I want them to be practical and basically relatable to anyone who's willing to work hard and uh, put in an honest day's work. Along with affordability, Taylor wants to focus on rural representation and crime reduction. Danielle Bain, TBT News. When we come back, we'll turn our attention to the other candidates running in Thunder Bay Superior North. Welcome back. Well, the NDP is usually a strong contender in the Thunder Bay Superior North riding, but its candidates have been unable to beat Liberal Patty Haidu in the last two elections. This time around, though, the party has a new candidate who's pressed pause on her law career in hopes of bringing the NDP back to representing the riding on Parliament Hill. Kurt Black reports. Thunder Bay lawyer Chantel Bryson believes she can bring a strong independent voice to Thunder Bay Superior North, something she feels has been missing in recent years due to the heavy influence of the Prime Minister's office. Adding if she is elected, Bryson will ensure the issues that affect those in the region will be her top priority. We're all about continuing to assist small business through the end of the pandemic, workers' rights and safety, um, and I have practiced in Indigenous justice and First Nation equal funding for a long time. So all of those things, um, and obviously a big focus on mental, sustainably fund mental health care and addictions care for the crisis our community is in. Bryson is confident all her years as a lawyer in the region makes her the ideal candidate to represent Thunder Bay Superior North. I've been involved in the issues for a long time, so I think I bring the knowledge and the skills forward to put forward viable solutions and to and get them to the implementation stage. That's what I'm all about, is implementing solutions to real bread and butter issues. Jobs, 
roof over the head, healthy food on the table, clean water. Kurt Black, TBT News. In the 2019 election, Green candidate Bruce Heyer won nearly 8.5 percent of the vote. This time, Amanda Madajong is hoping to grow that percentage in 2021. Ian Kaufman brings us this candidate profile. Canadians are tired of political bickering between the major parties and are ready for a change, says Green Party candidate Amanda Modijong. She promises her party would bring a more cooperative approach, keeping the focus on major issues like climate change, justice for Indigenous communities and the COVID-19 pandemic. I know from talking to people, climate change is still forefront on all of their agendas. They do definitely want to see a better response to the COVID uh, pandemic, 100%. And with that, they want a more concerted effort with the, between the federal and the provincial levels. The military veteran ran provincially in the riding in 2018 and federally in Thunder Bay Rainy River in 2019, finishing fourth each time. This year, she has minimized her in-person campaigning during an election she says shouldn't have been called during a pandemic. That election call is an example of the toxic culture of partisan politics in Ottawa, she says, one the Green Party would work to transform. It shouldn't be about the colour of the shirt that you wear. It should be about your actual ideals, how you manage to get things done, and what your focus is on Canadian people, right? When you stop focusing on Canadian people and start focusing on politicians having little squabbles here and there, you've lost the plot. Ian Kaufman, TBT News. Our coverage of the Thunder Bay Superior North race continues. Adam Riley now shines the spotlight on the candidates running for the People's Party of Canada and the Libertarian Party. The People's Party of Canada is just three years old and it's in its second ever federal election. In 2019, the party failed to win a single seat nationally, and in Thunder Bay Superior North, it placed fifth with just 725 votes. However, this time, they have a new voice reaching out to voters in the riding, Geraldton resident Rick Danes. A former OPP officer, Danes bought a local grocery store, never once thinking he would ever run for office. But now he is, and was attracted to the PPC by the party's four basic tenets. Respect, responsibility, fairness, and freedom. He believes it's been a top-down, one-way discussion between the government and the Indigenous peoples of the land. He wants to stop the alarmism around climate change and is no fan of the government being the sole source of information on COVID-19 and believes change for the region and the country can start with his party. I feel like in the um, there's been things going on with our, our current government and our current uh, situations in the world that I feel like it's everybody's responsibility to stand up and speak up and I felt that uh, this was uh, an opportunity that was presented to me where I have a chance to truly put in my efforts and to hopefully make a difference. Also from the region, vying for the opportunity to represent Thunder Bay Superior North in Ottawa is Marathon resident and returning Libertarian candidate Alex Vauden. In 2019, the Libertarians garnered 136 votes. Vauden says the region needs support for its mining and forestry sectors and believes the federal government interferes too much in the affairs of Indigenous peoples, suggesting giving treaty areas the same sovereignty as provinces are given. Our finances aren't great in the country, you know, um, but uh, I really dislike the uh, social conservatism that comes with uh, uh, most right-leaning parties, right? So I find the Libertarian is a, is a healthy mix of, um, of both uh, uh, financial responsibility and... Um, while still maintaining a, a leftist uh, social policies. Canadians will head to the polls on September 20th. Adam Riley, TBT News. Coming up after the break, we take you off to the races in Emo.
Welcome back. Well, in the town of Emo, the sounds of summer roar. Stock car racing at the Emo Speedway is a fixture in the district. And after last year's race season was decimated by the pandemic, drivers are thrilled to see the grandstands filled once again with attendance higher than it's been in years. Corey Nordstrom has the story. The sound of roaring engines signal that things are getting back to normal in the town of Emo. It's been one of our best seasons after we, got, we were loud fans. Usually we get maybe 200, we've been getting over four. The Borderland Racing Association hosts as many as 62 cars spanning three classes, with more racers this summer due to the closed American border. This year we've had more than we do usually do because we have uh, some that usually race in the States, but they can't, so now they're coming here. So. Yeah. Does that mean it's more competitive then? Oh yeah, exactly. We got Thunder Bay cars, we got Winnipeg cars, and we got one from the falls. The Borderland Racing Association held just five races last summer, but fans could not attend. This year, they're allowed to open at 75% capacity, and as you can see, it's pretty easy filling the seats at the Emo Speedway. So I like coming out here. I, I just like overall watching the races. It's, it's a pretty fun time. I really like the races. And I was cooped up in the house. Oh, this is really exciting to, for me to come out and watch the races again. Last year, it just felt like there was nothing to do. I missed it last year because I'm not really used to that. It's like something is missing from that year. Drivers like Brody Strand have spent summer weekends at the track for most of their lives. Following the season that last year was, a return to near normal is a welcome occurrence. It's kind of weird. You're thinking you should be racing and you're not even working on the car. That's what you do all summer long. Every weekend you're in the garage or you're at the track, so not having it, you don't really know what to do with yourself. It was hard last year. We didn't see a lot of people and the family is a huge part of our racing. We'll be here until 2 o'clock in the morning just chatting afterwards, and we weren't able to do that last year. You know, you got the crowd back, you got people up there. It's a completely different atmosphere. It really puts you in a spot of just, like, you really want to be here. In a regular year, the Racing Association hosts 20 races from May to August. This year, their 12th and final show will take place Labor Day weekend. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Students at Dennis Franklin Cromartie have been waiting since March of 2020 to finally return to the classroom, and now they have. The daily struggles of online learning were even more difficult for DFC due to remote internet access. But this week, things started to return to normal. Corey Nordstrom has more. It may not be normalcy yet at Dennis Franklin Cromartie High School, but a return to in-person schooling is long awaited as students can finally see teachers and friends after over a year and a half away from an environment they've come to miss. It would mostly be the sports and seeing people because I met so many good friends. I met my partner here too. And it's just like a, when you come in here, it's a, like a family you get the vibe of it's a big family. Last year, students had to stay in their home communities and receive their education over a computer, with spotty networks making an already difficult year even harder. Compared to the first year I was here in person, it was very challenging because there was a lot of technical issues and, oh, it's just so nerve-wracking. There's a lot of cutouts in lessons on online learning so that makes it kind of hard to understand what the teacher is saying what the assignment is during covid online schooling was tough for mostly everybody i know a bunch of people that dropped out i was close to dropping out but i still finished it. it's hard to check in on someone um, virtually just to make sure that they're doing well it wasn't so much focus on the academics it was making sure that they were that their well-being that they were okay that was our concern. The school held an assembly with local leadership to welcome students back and give them some advice on the year to come. You know, if things get hard, just reach out to someone and finish that school year. But start with today. DFC currently has 80 students enrolled in the high school, though that number will hopefully soon increase to as much as 130. They need boarding homes. So um, boarding parents that normally might have taken four or five students in now are just taking maybe one or two. 
So we have students that are still arriving the next few days, and uh, depending on when spaces open up for them. To keep students safe from the virus while at school, DFC has imposed staggered classes so hallways are less crowded, more cleaning staff have been hired, and signing in will now be common practice. Corey Nordstrom, TVT News. Thank you for joining us on this edition of Northwest Newsweek. I'm Alex Flood, and we hope you join us next time.